Welcome to the video presentation of the BPA AHDB meeting for small scale producers held on the 28th of June. The recent increases in feed prices have caused great hardship to many small scale producers and raised concerns over the future of our native breeds. The British Pig Association and the Rare Breed Survival Trust have been working with AHDB to address some of these concerns. And thanks to the support of AHDB, we're going to hear from Faye Murch of Kingsgate Nutrition about alternatives to compound feed. For this video presentation, we're going to skip the reasons behind the increase in feed prices and start with what a pig should look like. Pigs and breeds come in all shapes and sizes. So we will not be discussing target weights or growth rates. Instead, we will be talking about feeding to a body condition score. There is a well-established scale of body condition scoring from one to five, with the target being a body condition score of three. Faye is going to start the presentation by discussing the problems of feeding pigs with body condition scores that are less than ideal. Um, so it's going to cost us extra money to feed them during lactation because they've got no body fat in which to create the energy to make the milk. The other problem we have is when they're that thin, they're often very exhausted during the farrowing and post-farrowing period. So we have problems if they're having uh, larger litters with them farrowing the number of piglets that are inside them. So we often end up with more deaths in the later, later farrowing. We often have the other problem, which is really um, commonly missed, which is thin sows often milk really well. And the problem we then have is the problem with her health. She's basically working really hard to support her piglets and she's putting her piglets first instead of putting herself first. And this re increases her disease risk. So everything about her is on the pinnacle of falling over if she's a sow on condition score number one. Oh, I've lost my ability to move my slides over. There we go. Growers and finishers. Have you got uh, subtitles coming up? Oh, there we go. So growers and finishers, there we go. Uh, they cost extra money as well because they take far longer to finish. You can't send a pig in this condition to market. It's just going to be far too thin. It's going to be a poor eating quality, again, increased disease risk, and they just take forever to finish. Condition score five, on the other hand, our obese sow, she's going to cost us money. Number one, because she can't farrow. The, um, Birth canal is so wrapped up in fat that they struggle to pass the piglets through and out, so we end up losing piglets. Opposite to the very thin cells, they're often very poor milkers. So the pig, you end up having to um, support the piglets with milk substitutes, or worse than that, we lose the piglets, so they're costing you money in that sense. We often have joint issues because when a sow is that fat and gestating at the same time, she is putting a lot of pressure on her joints, especially if she's on really uneven surfaces. So we're adding disease risk or health risks to her. And then lastly, overlaid piglets. Fat sows really struggle to lie down considerately for their piglets. They just end up flopping. So we end up with much more overlays from our piglets. Growers and finishers, it just costs so much money. It means that you're feeding them too much if they're going out in this fat obese condition. So they're far too fatty. If you've been feeding them a really high energy diet all the way through, it's all fat, no protein, and you've just fed them a load of money for no benefit. So we're looking for this ideal shape, shape number three, looking at the back end, a really beautifully shaped pig. Just as a um, pointer, AHDB have got a really good section actually on their website about body condition scoring for sounds, but it's the same principle for all piglets. 
And there's a lovely video actually that goes with it. So I would suggest that you go and have a look at that, um, that type of material just to get your eye in. Okay, now we're getting to the juicy bit, which I know is what you've all been waiting for. Um, alternative raw materials. This is quite a beefy subject. So I've tried to break it down into sensible chunks. We're going to start with energy, move on to protein, then the fiber, and then probably the most important bit, how to feed it. Okay, so energy, again, we're going to split it up into three sections. We're going to split, split it up into root crops, which are our low energy products, grains, which are our mid energy products, and byproducts, which tend to be our high energy products. Okay. So I've tried to grade these ones for you just to give you a clue, although the numbers are so small, it's almost not worth it. So these are high energy at the top and low energy at the bottom. So sugar beets gives you a really good clue. That's the highest energy because it's obviously got the sugars in. All of these, basically you're looking at your root crops. They've all got a good fiber level as well, which is worth considering. But to me, as a nutritionist, I count these as energy products. So there's a couple of things to watch out for. Carrots and beetroot, um, these can colour your fat in your kid, particularly beetroot. If you think of um, the egg colourant in eggs, you get pale eggs and very dark red eggs, and that comes from a colourant which is very similar to what these um, products have. Potatoes, no green potatoes, and parsnips. There's a bit of a debate about parsnips, so um, a small amount of parsnips should be fine. Okay. Grains. Now we're all really familiar with these grains, whether you can or cannot get hold of these as straight products. I'm not really sure, but you might be able to. They're again, high energy down to low energy. Maize is the nicest. All pretty obvious products really, but there is one point that should come out with this, which is they must be milled. No whole grains should be fed to pigs. And the reason being, it literally just comes straight out the other end. It can then create other problems while it's at it. So no whole grains, it must have some form of milling. If it's cracked, great. If it's not cracked and flattened, great as well, doesn't matter. This time of year, we just have to be careful. I will cover these points, concern points again later because they're important. But this time of year, farmers are often emptying their sheds out and it tends to be the rubbish that we get. So we must check it carefully. So these are probably the things that you were thinking of more, um, which is the byproducts. We've got these byproducts because they're processed, they are nearly always really high in energy. And this should send alarm bells going off to people with one gestating cells and two with finisher piece, because energy creates fat. If you think of what these are in a human diet, these are all really um, fat on the hips kind of job. As much as I love um, cream and biscuits, uh, I have to limit myself. And that's what we have to do with the pigs as well. We've got to look at the pigs that we're feeding and make sure that we're feeding to that body con condition score number three to make sure that we're not overfeeding these really rich sweet sugary fatty substances. Co-products down here like ethanol um, from um, syrup from ethanol production these are actually high energy products as well but you have to feed more of them because they're a lower dry matter. So that means when we talk about dry matter, um, we're kind of relating it back to wheat and barley, which is 87% dry matter. These tend to be 24% dry matter. So you have to feed effectively three times as much to have the same dry matter intake. So when you look at this type of product on a dry matter basis, it's just as energy rich as something like bread. Okay. So I'm sure you've seen all of those. This is um, not a full list. I'm sure you can get hold of more things, but it kind of gives you an idea of the type of products that we're looking at. Really high point to mention is any suppliers of these products or other products that are going into the feed industry must be registered with um, their local authorities and trading standards as a feed supplier. So proteins, 
legumes we're going to talk about, five products, and then I've labelled here the be carefuls, um, because they're the pitfalls that people often fall into. So legumes, I'm sure we've all seen these, peas, beans, linseed, chickpeas, lentils, lupins, anything else that you can get hold of. To be fair, they are all pretty expensive at the moment. The cost proteins across the board are expensive. We saw the, lin uh, the sunflowers, the soya and the rapeseed meal are all expensive. Everything else within this section is also expensive because these act as fillers to fill that gap from, um, uh, from the sunflowers. Um, peas are probably the highest protein, chickpeas are probably the lowest, but they're all much of a muchness. Again, with these, you must make sure that there's some form of milling or cracking. Proteins in particular, we don't want them passing through to the hind gut. So we want everything to be broken down to some degree before we feed it to the pig. Pigs are pretty lazy and they don't like chewing. So they tend to just eat a tiny bit of chewing if necessary and swallow. So byproducts on our wets, uh, on our proteins. These are products that you're probably used to seeing and may have come across or may not. But whey, this is a beautiful product. I feed a lot of whey to pigs in the commercial area. We have to be careful because of the bloat risk. And that comes from, it's very high in sodium because of the cheese manufacturing industry. You can also get tofu whey um, from certain manufacturers. Um, so there is ju not just milk whey, but tofu whey as well. You can feed the curds as well to pigs. They like that as well. They do block pipes and everything like that. So you just have to be careful. Yogurts, yogurts are a protein. They have to be seen as a protein, but anything that you're buying that might be in a pot or come out of a pot or made for human consumption, they tend to have a lot of sugar in. So you have to remember that products like this have a lot of energy coming with them as well. Also a note here is a fermentation list. We'll come onto that a little bit later. Cheese, also a protein, again, high in energy, so being careful. And then we've got these, the brewer's yeast, this comes wet or dry, brewer's grains, also a protein, as well as a slight energy source as well, and fruit pulp. This is not a definitive list, so just take your ideas from it and um, work with it. Again, the suppliers have got to be registered with their local feed, uh, authorities with trading standards. Okay, now the careful products. I often get asked, asked about these um, when people find out what my job is. Eggs and milk, can I feed them? Yes, you can feed them, but they come with their own um, legislation. So again, eggs and milks must have been processed at a registered site. So that might be a milk processing site or an egg processing site but they must then be registered to feed that, that byproduct or waste eggs or shelled eggs or wet eggs as an animal feed. Raw milk and raw eggs you can feed, but the supplier must be registered to supply a raw feed. It's slightly different to just being registered to supply a co-product. So they must be registered to supply a raw feed. The other one, which I don't think you will come across, but just in case you did, is fish. Now, legally, you can feed fish, but the difficulty is you, as a site, have to be registered with trading standards to, to feed fish. So here for today, I would suggest that it's probably a no-go. It tends to be very expensive as a protein goes, and to be perfect, perfectly honest, the breed types of your pigs probably don't require such a specifically high protein as a fish meal. Lastly, my last careful is you cannot feed any meat products or anything that has been anywhere near meat products because of the risks of the foot and mouth as we just heard from Marcus earlier. Okay, so we're getting through it now. So here we come to the fibres. Fibres are, I've split into three sections because they they might not seem different to you, but they're different to me the way that I've seen them. So we've got dried products, greens, and byproducts. Okay. So the thing to remember 
about fiber and energy, as I alluded to earlier, is when fiber is low, energy is high. When energy is low, fiber is high. Okay, so they, they kind of go down together. So one is a trade off for the other. Okay. So when we look at dried products, we might look at silage. So this could encompass anything coming out of um, off farms because they're busy emptying clamps ready to refill their clamps. We might have hays, straws and barley. So these here are listed with the lowest level of fibre through to the highest level of fibre. So although silage doesn't have a really high amount of energy, it's higher than barley straw. Okay, so just worth remembering what it is that you're feeding to what animals are at what point. So greens, <coughs> excuse me, greens, innumerable greens. I'm sure this time of year we could come up with anything at all on the list of greens because that's all being produced. So just a quick summary of some, some of the greens that are available. We've got the broccoli is the, the brassicas, basically. Just remembering, I've put some coloured cauliflowers in here just to throw you and hoping that you're still awake. Um, just to remember that these count as orange and reds. So just remembering that colouring of fat, just in case you happen to get a whole ton load of uh, red cauliflowers. This will also got the curcubits, which is a name that I love, uh, which is the cucumbers, the marrows, etc, etc. And squashes also come into this one, so pumpkin squashes, a bit early for those coming out of places yet, but they will come later in the year. All of these great products for keeping um, our livestock feeling nice and full. Squashes do come with a bit of energy actually, um, but they're very watery. All of these three here tend to be very watery. So the amount of fibre and the amount of, that you're actually getting from them is, it, it tends to be quite low. Just remembering again the red and the orange in the fat. And then herbal lace, I didn't quite know what to call this section, because it's not just grasses, it's kind of everything that you might find, verges, fields, whatever you come across. So grasses, clovers, mixed lace. Again, lovely, lush, they're just starting to dry off now naturally themselves, so they're probably coming more dried hay type products. But where you can get the lush grasses, clovers, mixed lay, it's a good fibre source for those um, sows, finishers, and even the growers. So the byproducts. Um, so it's what you can find around the place. I've been really optimistic, actually, and thinking that you might all be right next to um, chocolate producers, because that's what I'd like to be next door to, but I'm not. So that you could get cocoa holes, any kind of holes, husks, or pulp, great for those sows just to keep them feeling full. Don't go overboard. And the only thing to really look out for um, on these, so anything that's a husk that's come from the outside of um, a, a plant or a seed. So these ones up here, not the citrus pulp, are at high risk of being um, a mold carrier, a mycotoxin as we call it. But we can come on to that in a minute. Anybody that doesn't know, that's the top of the head of the mycotoxin. Very pretty, really. Okay, so <clears throat> we're whizzing through this, I realise, um, but if you're keeping up, I'm really pleased. So how are we going to feed this? The first thing I want to remind you is don't forget the compound, okay? Compound brings vitamins and minerals and what I call the Holland and Barrett effect. It brings all the additives, all those extra little bits, enzymes, health, omega-3s, anything else that they might have decided to put in it. And from our protein point of view, it provides amino acids, which are the little building bricks that create protein. So it's giving you a backup alongside your alternative raw materials. So I'm gonna show you very, um, generally, how we're going to blend those. Sorry. So we're going to have um, young pigs and early growers. These are the most crucial. This is the most crucial stage for your piglets. They're most at risk with their health. They grow at their fastest rate at this point. At about seven or eight weeks of age, pigs, young pigs can grow at a feed conversion rate of one to one, which means one kilogram of feed produces one kilogram of pork. 
So we need to embrace that to make sure that we're getting the best growth that we possibly can out of these pigs to make sure that they are costing us the least amount of money to feed. So I'm suggesting that you feed a minimum of 75% compound and then top up that plate with your alternative raw materials plate. Okay, so I'm gonna show you in a minute how we're gonna make this plate up, how you decide what raw materials to feed those pigs. But we're gonna feed them about 75% compound and use it as a balancer and 25% of alternative raw materials for those small pigs. When the sow's finishes are a bit different because they've progressed. Their digestive system has developed. They're much better at dealing with fibres. They're a lot healthier. They're a lower disease risk. And they're kind of more past the um, risk period. So we can be a bit more aggressive with those. So I'm suggesting here a 50% compound with a 50% of alternative speeds. So we're maintaining the vitamin and the minerals and the balance of the diet with the compound for these young pigs and these older pigs. And we're reducing the cost here at 25% of alternative raw materials and 50% for the sows and the finishes. So how is this plate here made up? So I resorted to a human plate. Unfortunately, I couldn't find one without sufficient editing. So I'm gonna have to bear with me. So this is very similar to how I want you to see your plate for your pigs. There's just one thing that I want to change so that it looks what we've been talking about. This section here, this really small little bit in the middle, is your high energy products. This section here is not necessarily just carbohydrates, it's energy. So we've got a huge section, 50% of our plate is going to be fibre. A quarter of it with our protein products, and a quarter of it as energy products and very small amounts of high energy feed, okay? Now I realize that's slightly difficult to picture. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you um, a little bit on how we're going to break that down for each section of the, the livestock of the, of the animals. So I've got three columns here. We've got an energy column, a protein column and a fiber column. And down here, we've got sows that are gestating, sows that are lactating, weaners, growers, and finishers. So for a sow, a gestating sow, she's basically not doing much other than lying down, going to sleep and growing some piglets. Low energy, low protein, high fiber. We want that high fiber to keep her happy, to keep her guts working, to get high gut fermentation, so that she gets a healthy <coughs> microbiota, so that she becomes a healthy animal. Because if a healthy mum makes a healthy piglet, but only conditions for three. Lactating sounds, they need, these need a bit more energy. So I put low to medium here, because if you've got a sow with only three or four piglets, she only needs a low energy. If she's conditioned score three, she can probably do the lactation with a low energy diet. She's got 10 or 12 piglets, she's going to need a more medium energy diet because she's having to produce substantially more milk. The same with protein. The protein basically for this lactating cell is milk. So protein is milk, energy is produced, the ability to produce the milk. Fibre, medium to high, just to keep her happy as long as she's getting enough energy and she's not losing body condition score. Our other crucial section here, weaners. We don't want them to have a really high fibre diet. Yes, they need fibre. Yes, they can eat greens, but they must eat enough high energy and high protein to grow and to grow fast. If we just feed them a really high fibre diet, they will end up reducing in size and becoming from a three down to a two down to a one because they can't extract enough energy from fiber because their digestive system just isn't ready for it yet. Growers are moving up that scale so they are able to digest more so they can have a higher fiber, a medium fiber level and the finishers are having a medium to high just depending on um, how fat they're getting how much work they're doing and how fast they're growing. So I'm going to realise that that's also very difficult to follow. So I'm going to break it down a little bit more 
into what we can use for each section. Okay, so gestating sows, loads of fiber, all sources, any of the sources that we talked about before, any that you like, just pop them in front of her. As long as they're not energy rich, you should be fine. Keeping a target weight on her of the number three. She must be looking number three. If your feet, if she's getting more over to number four, you're feeding her too much energy. So energy, root crops are good. No high energy products for this gestating sack because she's just going to pile on the weight. And she doesn't actually need much um, protein either because she can do most of it herself. Lactating sows. These need a bit more, so you can use your root crops with a bit more aggression. You can use your cereals. You can use a little bit of the high energy products, provided, I hope you're getting the gist of this, that she is a target number three size. Okay, legumes, byproducts, proteins, medium amounts, don't go overboard because it'll just come out of the back end and it'd just be a waste of um, putting protein into her. Again, fibre, you can use all the sources with her, keep her ticking over, give her as much as she needs, almost ad lib, as long as she's getting enough energy in her and she's not reducing down the scale of the condition score. You get the, I'm hoping that you're getting the gist of this because there's a bit of a theme going. So weaners, things to avoid. We don't want them having really high fibre products. So those byproducts, so soya hulls, um, are a real no-no for young piglets. Um, they'll probably pick up a little bit from mum, but you don't really want them eating masses of them because they just can't process them and it just slows them down growing. And the best way we can um, make the most of our money is to make them grow as fast as possible. You don't really want them having straw and things. You're going to have it for bedding, so they're going to eat that anyway. So just don't give them extra. And then the energies, they can have these cereals, they can have some of these high energy products. I'd steer a bit clearer of the root crops for them because the fibre that comes along with them. Um, but they can have a little bit of that as well. Um, so yeah, we can move these around to fit the size of the pig. And who can guess what we're targeting? Condition score number three. Yeah, anybody that said that, that's a point. Rowers, similar, so we're moving on. Medium, medium, medium. So cereals, root crops have moved up for these animals, but the high energy products have moved down because they're starting to lay down fat, but they can have a little bit. Legumes, still in the middle here, don't go overboard, but don't underdo them. Greens, yeah, they can have some greens, why not? Let's, let's start building those fibres, let's start providing them with some um, uh, good sources of vit natural vitamins. Dry products, yep, they can have some of those as well. They can have the haze, the silages, as long as you're getting enough in them and that they are on their target condition score number three. Last one, finishers. I hope you're getting the gist now. So, yeah, a lot more dry products on the fibre side here for these um, finishers. Uh, they can have plenty of greens, plenty of dry product products. They can have a low usage of the bride byproducts, the oat husks, the hulls, those type of things. You can move that up to a medium usage if you're having to keep them on farm, if they're getting a bit old, if they look as if they're getting on the fat side, just to keep them full and keep that digestive system working. Good source of root crops, um, just making sure that we're not overdoing them. Good use of cereals. Again, when they're coming to that point of finish, um, avoid those high energy products just it just packs on the fat onto them target yeah body condition score number three you're absolutely right so what happens if we've got a body condition score number three that's great you're doing everything right keep going what happens if a pig is body condition score number one what do we do then we decrease the fiber that they're getting. So whatever fiber you're giving them, reduce it. Whatever energy you're giving them, increase it. So if you've got a pig that is fading, which is looking a bit ribby, they should not be looking ribby. You need to give them more energy to work with. Don't worry too much about the protein. The protein, as long as you've got a good source and you're still providing the compound, you should have a good source of protein. Um, but it's energy that they're lacking. 
check the health status, make sure that they're not poorly with something. Um, if needs be, you can check with the vet. vet. But if you think it's just what you're feeding, increase the energy. And then it's really simple. If pigs are obese, we do it the other way around. We increase the fiber, give them loads of fiber, fill them up with fiber and drop that energy, energy right down. Okay. So, sourcing ideas. I'm sure you guys have got much better ideas than me, so we're not going to dally around with this one too long. Farm waste. It's getting to a busy time on farms now. Um, I'm married to a farmer here and we grow quite a lot of root crops. So they'll be being harvested, the carrots will be being harvested soon, so people will be processing vegetable waste. The greens are all growing if you're based over in Lincolnshire, so there will be stalks being gotten rid of. Straw will be starting to come, they're just starting to combine the barley now. The silage, people will be emptying the silage clamps because the silage and the hay are coming in as well. It's also fruit picking season, there's also strawberry farms, cherry farms, heaven only knows what other farms, so just see what you can find and speak to your local producers and see what you can find. Green grocers, waste, fruit and veg, as long as they do not have meat products or are selling no delicatessens or anything like that, then you can use the fruit and vegetable waste. Yes, they have to be licensed with trading standards, but it shouldn't be difficult to have a licensed trading premises anyway as our farmers, which I should have mentioned. Last one I've got, I didn't really know, I was hoping to create a bit of a discussion with it as well, is allotments. Fruit waste and vegetable waste. Yet, yeah, I'm not sure if any of them would let you have any, um, because I'm sure that they'll be composting it, but maybe there's something you can do, food for muck, um, because if you've got more straw, they might appreciate that going back to the allotment. Now, this is my favourite one. This is the artisan products. If you've got anybody producing anything near you, bakeries, breweries, cereal manufacturers, I mean, that was interesting. We had an absolute glut of um, granola uh, two years ago. And we were feeding granola to piglets. They absolutely loved it. It was like instant piglet feed. Cheese makers, dairy farmers, flour mills, ice cream parlours, anything potato, if it's cooked, all the better. It's slightly better digestible, slightly higher in energy for them. And then this is my favourite one, the winemakers. This is just to remind me that we're getting towards the end. Okay, now the difficult bit. So we're coming to pitfalls. I didn't really want to scare everybody, so I've broken it down again into three, into four sections. Poisons, I'm not really going to go into that too much. Health risks, my warnings, and just a little bit of guidance. So poisons, we've already touched on one. Green potatoes, you wouldn't feed them to your kids, so don't feed them to your kids. Rhubarb, you would feed them to your kids if you can get them to eat them, but I won't, wouldn't recommend it, particularly the leaves, excuse me, for pigs, because the toxicity levels in rhubarb are quite high. You might have fed some to pigs in the past, and pigs can cope with some poisons in very low levels, hence the parsnips. Even a lot of root vegetables are mildly poisonous, but as long as they're in um, not massive levels, then actually they should be fine. Raising, when you're grazing, I know we have quite a bit of hemlock and bracken around us around here, so just keep your eyes peeled uh, around these ones. Bracken isn't actually poisonous, um, but it contains an enzyme that, help, that breaks down vitamins that you're feeding your pig, which leads to health issues. There's lots of other ones to be careful of um, when you're grazing pigs, so just be careful, uh, and if in doubt, look it up. So these are the important ones to me. These are the health risks from what you might be feeding to your pigs as byproducts, co-products, or anything else you might come across. Fermentation. Fermentation is not good. Um, it often occurs in moist products, wet products, and fruit products. So what happens is you get this bubbling effect. And that bubbling effect, sadly, passes down, straight down into the um, pig's gut. And it blows up and the piglet's gut swells up with the fermentation and ends up twisting. And it leads to sudden death. It's not very nice. It's um, really quite horrific for the pig. 
So you have to be looking out for this. To see how fast things are fermenting, you can put your wet products or your moist products, shaken up with a little bit of liquid, into a lemonade bottle, squeeze it, and then put the lid on, uh, half fill it, squeeze it, put the lid on, and then see how quickly it fills that, um, makes that um, pop out, the squeezed out bit. If it's within hours, that's really no good at all. If it's over a few days, then you could probably get away with it in low amounts. I don't know how well you can see this, but this is ergot. So these little dark grains here are brutal beasts. Um, they cause agalactia, which is no milk in sass. They cause abortion, they cause death. They cause necrosis, gangrene, poor appetite, death. They actually cause a lot more than this. I've tried to limit myself. This has been really prevalent, this last harvest. So what's coming out of the sheds now? A lot of producers, farmers, have had to be cleaning their grains all year to be able to get those grains into um, mills, flour mills or feed mills. Where's that ergot gone? Some of them will be taking the risk and blending it and selling it to anybody that can, will, they think that they can get away with it with. I've seen that happen on farms in the commercial sense, let alone anything else. So just be careful, know what it is that you're buying, check it before you have it delivered. The same goes for this little one as well here. I don't know if you can see, but these are pink grains um, on wheat. You can also get fusarium, as it's called, a mycotoxin, on barley, on rye, on oats, on anything. And it's been very prevalent in last year's harvest again. So this again causes abortion, poor reproduction. Growers, you don't really see much of a problem in the growers, but poor appetite and loss of growth, which we really can't afford at the moment. So check it, make sure you know what's coming. So health risks, second plague, moulds and mycotoxins, anything that you're buying, oh, the list is endless, look, it's just not worth it. You do not want to feed your livestock mouldy food. Um, this goes on and on and on and on this list. I got fed up with writing them down, but check it. It should not be mouldy. Nothing that you feed to your animal, especially breeding animals and young animals, should not be being fed any mould at all. If it's mouldy, it's going to take longer for your finishes to feed. It's just expensive. There are additives that you can use to top dress over the top of it, but it's just all cost. So don't buy it in the first place. And then we've touched on this one before but already, which is excess whey can lead to bloat and death. I just wanted to really highlight that one. If you do see your pigs bloating, if you are feeding whey, cut the whey right down and get a load of water into them and you might be able to um, uh, save them. So these are more warnings. So we've mentioned this one, green, red and orange gives um, yellowing fat. Salt, excess salt. When you're feeding a lot of byproducts, you get excess salt. Crisps, it's amazing how much salt there is in cakes, biscuits, any of those types of things that you might be feeding especially in warm weather, leads to dehydration. So you must have plenty of water available so that they can rinse that salt out. It's amazing how much salt they can manage as long as you have plenty, lots of fresh water. So that's all day free access. We touched on this one as well, whole grains, unmilled cereals, it basically passes out through the dung. It causes looseness because the piglets have got um, fibres going through and the wrong um, microbiota of growing on them. But then also worse than that, what you can have happen is the pigs then start rooting through the dung to get the whole grains out, to have another go at it, which then leads to um, digestive infection. Not worth it. So make sure it's milled. Same for protein. And then lastly, on this slide, on the warnings, I put this one up because this is common. You see this come through the commercial side and it's a headache, I have to say. Screening from a mill, a processor or a farm. And you can see it's quite a small picture, but you can see it's not this beautiful, clean grain here. It's bits of straw, it's bits of husks, it's bits of everything. 
if you get this, it must be expected that you're going to have some form of mycotoxin in it, is the best way to work with it. If you must have it, feed it in very small quantities and do not feed it to sows, breeding sows, in pig sows or pig sows that are expecting to be served. If you want to feed it to anything at all, feed it to finishers, but in my view, I would not recommend it. So guidance, so what should you be doing? It's all pretty obvious, really. Look at it carefully. There should be no mould, there should be no slime, there should be no ergot, and there should be no fusarium in anything that you feed. Use your nose, smell it. I spend a lot of time with a dirty nose because I'm smelling most of the raw materials or the feed that is being fed on farm. It should smell good. If it doesn't smell good, it's probably not good. And lastly, fresh water, plenty of it, clean, cleaned every day, fresh clean water that isn't uh, had the sow rolling in it, which I know does happen, but plenty of fresh clean water every single day. So we're coming on to the difficult bit, which is the legals, very important. We're gonna break this down, the elephant in the room, which I know you're all waiting for. The common questions I get asked, which is a little bit of fun really, and a, just a reminder, because we've done them, but of the feed legals. So we all know it is illegal to feed kitchen waste and scraps to pigs. It's really not worth it. And why are we not feeding? waste to the pigs from the kitchen. Now, I've quoted this directly from DEFRA because there's no other way of saying it. I'm literally going to read it to you. It's illegal to feed catering waste or animal byproduct to any farmed animal or any other ruminant animal, pig or poultry. The term catering waste includes all waste food, including used cooking oil originating in restaurants, catering facilities and kitchens, including central kitchens and household kitchens. This definition, therefore, includes all kitchens, including kitchens where vegetarian foods are prepared. The effects of this ban is that you must not feed such material to farm animals, which includes any pig, including pet pigs, nor let such animals have access to such material, nor bring such material onto holdings where such animals are kept. That means if you are by a footpath, your pigs could be at risk of sandwiches. You do not want that. You need to have your signs up saying that you do not want your pigs to be exposed to waste from people's kitchens, whether that's their packed lunch waste or anything else, because you have no idea where it has been and what it has been in contact with. And why are DEFRA so strongly wording this online? Um, anybody that dealt with the foot and mouth cases in 2001, like I know Marcus, Tony and myself did, would know why and why we don't want it to happen again. The first confirmed case of the 2001 outbreak of foot and mouth disease was a holding where waste food was being fed to pigs, was swill feeding and not being done properly, not being done to a good enough level. It only takes one for, for it to be in it. And we've just seen that from that risk that came, that scare that came over the weekend. So they say online, this is again direct from DEFRA, contaminated waste food spreads viruses such as foot and mouth disease and African swine fever to farmed animals. Infected pigs can quickly infect neighbouring animals. So these diseases risk the nation's entire pig population, including pets, as mass culling must take place for the eradication. That's me. That is not DEFRA. But it is holds such a place in my heart because it's having lived through it, I don't ever want to have to see people live through that again. And the one thing that we can do all to help that is to not feed kitchen waste. So heavy bit done, let's move on to common questions. Now I've had a bit of fun with this. Anybody know what that is? Vincent van Gogh, peasant woman gleaning, backbreaking work. Can I go gleaning is the most common thing I get asked. Well, yeah, you can, as long as you've got the landowner's permission. Do you get caught by the farmer? It's trespassing and it's theft, effectively. My husband loves to tell me that. Um, and this is where you'll end up. Um, so it is backbreaking work, but you know, we're just coming to that time of year where actually we probably could do it. 
And most farms that are producing um, food or feed waste would be registered with trading standards. You can check with them and you ought to check with them, um, but that should be fine. Now, my second question, I really like the picture for this one, so I'm hoping you guys do too. Can I take my pig for a walk so it can graze en route? Well, yes, you can actually, but there's a big proviso. All pig movements require a movement license, but pig walking requires a specific license with a pre-approved route. Why a pre-approved route? Well, I think we've just seen over the weekend when they had a cordon zone, if you were pet walking your pig and you were hoping to walk into that cordon zone, Defra would phone you and say, no, you can't go out walking your pig on that route today, terrible, sorry. So yes, you can take them out grazing, but you must have a walking license with a pre-approved list. For a quick recap of the legals, we're going to be really quick with this. Uh, that glass of wine is shouting at me. Surplus food supplies must be trading standards registered. If you're going to feed fish, you must be registered with trading standards and this costs money and you have to be inspected. And just a reminder on the milk, if they're supplying you with raw milk and eggs, then they have to be um, registered for a raw food supply with trading standards. And finally, with their questions, that's the lot. Anybody got any questions? You mentioned uh, you mentioned earlier about the risk uh, of footpaths, and uh, it's uh, I'd like to remind everybody that AHDB do produce uh, "Don't Feed the Pig" signs, which um, you can uh, contact them via their website and they will send them out to you. So please do take advantage of that and make sure that um, that if you've got a footpath, then uh, you, you've put, put up signs. The, uh, the problem that they were looking at in Norfolk, footpath through the farm. And um, if any of you remember back to the um, uh, classical swine fever that we had in 2000, same issue. There was a footpath right next to the paddock where the sow that was the index case was um, uh, was found, and the only explanation we've got is somebody chucking a sandwich in there. So it's a very big risk having uh, people who probably well-meaning, thinking, "Oh, isn't it marvellous? You know, I'll uh, I'll give this, um, I'll give the rest of my packed lunch to the uh, to the pigs," without really understanding what the implications are. So please do, uh, if you need signs, then uh, get onto the HDB website and, uh, and you can order them from there. Okay, so if there's no more questions, then uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everybody for coming out this evening. I hope you found that useful. The idea here was to provide a framework that you can work, work with to see there's such a vast array of different uh, materials out there. So you can look at what might be available, where you can get it from, how you can get it legally, and how you can uh, build up your, your own regime for feeding alternative feeds alongside compound feed and uh, develop your own strategies. It's really not possible to have a meeting like this and give out um, individual feeding plans to, uh, to all the people because clearly every farm is different with different pigs and uh, different availabilities. But we will share the, uh, the presentation to those of you who are here so that you can um, um, you can look at it again. We'll also put it up as a video so that uh, if you want to come back and watch it, you can do that. If you've got any specific questions that you think of afterwards, please do email them in uh, to uh, BPA, British, BPA at BritishPigs.org or you can go on our website and there's, um, there's a link there that you can send in questions from either way and we'll do our best to uh, to get you some answers. And this is the first of a series. So this one, this meeting tonight was designed to, um, to look at the immediate problem. You know, how are you going to 
feed your pigs through the next six months or so, what can we do to try and make sure that, that uh, as uh, hopefully things uh, perhaps improve towards the end of the year and beginning of next year, that we've still got our, um, our pig herds uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to build back from. Clearly, we're very concerned about the effect that this current crisis would have on, uh, uh, on our native breeds particularly. But we're going to uh, have another of these meetings looking in more detail at uh, nutrition and also to discuss how we could come up with um, more appropriate uh, feeding regimes for particularly for native breed pigs. And the pigs that we've got, uh, particularly the, uh, the traditional breeds, they're, uh, they're breeds that are pretty much the same as they might have been in the 50s and 60s. And yet um, the commercial pigs have had uh, all that uh, time in between where they've been bred and bred and bred to be able to uh, work with rocket fuel feeds. And those feeds are uh, not necessarily ideal for the type of pigs that, um, that many uh, of our BPA members anyway are trying to produce. So we're interested in the medium term looking at how we might come up with a scheme to develop more appropriate diets and see whether we can work with, um, with mills to produce those for, uh, um, for our keepers because clearly that's going to be more efficient and uh, we're, going, we're not going to be wasting a lot of, uh, a lot of extremely expensive um, nutritional ingredients coming straight out the, uh, out the back of the pig. So there will be uh, a series of these uh, over the next, uh, the next six to nine months. But in the meantime, I say, if you've got any specific questions that you think we might be, be able to help with, then please do get in touch with me at, um, at the BPA. And that really just leaves me to uh, say thank you to Tony for helping to, for organizing this through the uh, good offices of uh, AHDB. I'm sorry that um, the uh, internet connection up where he is isn't, uh, isn't good enough for him to be able to join us, but I hope that we'll be able to resolve that for, uh, for future meetings. But in particular, thank you very much, Faye, for um, such an interesting presentation. And, um, We've had a couple of comments here in the in the chat. People uh, saying that they found it very interesting. So, thank you very much indeed for that. And with that, I'll uh, say good night to everybody, and thank you very much.